Hi everyone, my name is Adina Feinstein. I am a third year graduate student at the University of Chicago and the lead software developer for the Eleanor, Eleanor Python package, which is used to create light curves from anything that is in the test full frame images. And so today I am hoping to give you a really informative tutorial on how to use Eleanor and all of its basic tools, as well as some of its cool visualization functions um, with the hopes that it will help you with whatever science that you would like to use Eleanor for. So just some quick links. Um, I will make this Jupyter notebook that I'm working in available to everybody through my GitHub. Um, and I'll post a link to that in the Slack. But um, other, other useful resources are the Eleanor documentation, which is hosted over here um, at my personal website backslash Eleanor. Um, and then you can go through. We have a bunch of really awesome tutorials, tips, tricks, and hacks, as well as going over some of the other classes that we have written. Um, and then also you can access Eleanor through GitHub. So if you haven't yet installed it on your machine or you're thinking, you know, is Eleanor for you? And if it is, you decide you want to install it, um, you can either do so by using the GitHub or you can pip install Eleanor if you use PyPI. Okay, great, so let's jump right in. Um, so these are just some packages that we're gonna need later on. NumPy, Matplotlib, what would we do without you? Um, and then also just fixing the font size. So hopefully everything will be clearer for you. Great, so the first thing that you will want to do with Eleanor is have some kind of identifier for your target. This can either be a tick ID, so test input catalog ID, a set of coordinates, a Gaia ID, or the name of the star. And I should say that you can pass in an AstroPy SkyCord object, or you can pass in a list of coordinates that are given in degrees. And so if you have some way to identify your target um, and you know what sector your target was observed in, that's great. If not, that's totally fine. Um, you don't need to know what sector it was observed in to use Eleanor. It will just automatically download the latest sector that your target was observed in. And so for this example, I'm going to be using WASP 100, which is a target in the continuous viewing zone. Um, and so I just randomly chose sector three here. Um, and so this Eleanor.source object will take in your identifier here. I'm giving it the name. Um, the sector, if you have it, if not, again, that's okay. Um, and what it's going to do is gain some basic and get some basic information about your target. So it's also going to cross match your name with the tick ID, the coordinates and the guy ID. So you'll have all of that information. Um, and it's also going to download a few things. So WASP 100, because it was observed in sector three, will download some of the Eleanor data products that we have available um, currently. So these are only available for the first 13 sectors, the entire Southern Hemisphere. And the three things that it downloads are the Eleanor postcard, which is a smaller cutout region of the full frame image. The um, background, the 2D background modeling that we create to try and remove as many systematics and background issues as possible. Um, and a pointing model that we have created using centroids of the stars on the, post, on the um, full frame image level. And so if, you're, look, if your target is somewhere in the northern ecliptic hemisphere and you don't see that it's downloading this, that's fine. You shouldn't panic. Um, instead, what we're doing right now is we're using test cut behind the scenes. So it's only going to download a larger test cut file for that. Um, and so now that we have our star object with all of this information and the files that we've downloaded, we can cross match it. So now we have the tick for our star, the coordinates, the guy ID, um, and we also know what camera and chip it was and CCD it was observed on with tests, if that is interesting, um, if that is, you know, something that you want to know. And so that's pretty straightforward. That's really all that the um, Eleanor.source class does. So in order to make a light curve, we need to pass in that source object um, because it set everything up for us. And then we put it into this Eleanor.target data object. And so there are additional arguments that we can use here, such as setting the size of our target pixel file or TPF. 
um, which is just the smaller cutout region around your source. You can also do things like create a point spread function model light curve um, and create a light curve using principal component analysis. So for this tutorial, I am going to set both of those to be true. So I want a PSF light curve and I want a PCA light curve and we'll look through all of those. And so it's gonna pop up some warnings. These warnings are okay. And then um, some things from TensorFlow and then it's going to show this loading bar. And this, all this loading bar is doing is creating the point spread function model of light curve for our star. And so that's it. That's how long it takes to make a light curve for one object per one sector. And so there are lots of, uh, there's lots of additional information that we now have in this Eleanor.target data object. Um, and one of the maybe key things to look out for is the type of background subtraction that Eleanor is doing behind the scenes. So the Eleanor light curves are tailored to find transits. So we're trying to minimize the combined differential photometric precision, um, which is just the noise out of transit. And so we're trying three different background techniques. The first one is a 1D postcard, which is a constant value that's calculated per each postcard frame masking all the stars. The other thing that we do is a 1D target pixel file background. So it's the same constant value calculated from the TPF frame, again, masking any stars in that region. And then the third thing that we try is the 2D background. So this is a model of background that we've created beforehand that you downloaded when you created that Eleanor.source object. And so we could take a look at what those um, look like. So this is an example of one of the 2D backgrounds. So there are lots of stars in this field, and you can see these bright regions that are used for background subtraction. Um, and so that's great. That's fine. Um, and then you can see which background Eleanor actually used behind the scenes by calling this data.bkg underscore type. And so what we're seeing here is the background type is PC underscore level, which stands for postcard level. So this is the 1D constant that was taken from the postcard level background. So it wasn't the 2D and it wasn't the more localized background that's done on the target pixel file level. Okay, and we can see what that looks like because this is the 2D, so what does the 1D look like? Um, and it looks like this and we have these nice typical uh, ramp ups at the end of each orbit for tests. And so when it does the light curve processing, it's gonna subtract these values out. Great. So um, one of the other things that Eleanor does is test a whole suite of apertures. So again, we're trying to minimize the CDPP. And so by testing all of these apertures with all of these different backgrounds, um, we're hoping to get the cleanest light curve for transits that we can. And so you can look at what the aperture is that Eleanor chose. It's this nice square right here for WASP 100 and Sector 3. Um, sometimes the apertures will change from sector to sector. That's also okay. Um, and then the target pixel file, I've just plotted in the background so you can kind of see the star peeping through another little star friend over there. Um, one of the other ways that you can maybe better visualize this aperture instead of plotting something um, with a low alpha value on top is you can use the Eleanor.visualize class, which we've created. And so you just pass in your data, your Eleanor.target data object, um, and you can nicely overplot your contour and you can like set colors and do fun things there. So um, that's just maybe a better way to see it. And we'll go back to other things, um, other features that are in these visual, this visualized class a little bit later on. Okay, so that was it. We have our aperture. We have hopefully a good background model. We have our PSF model light curve. We have our PCA model light curve. Um, and so I think it's time to look at some light curves. And so the first thing that you will probably want to do is um, mask any bad cadences with our with the quality flags. And so the quality flags come from two places. The first is that we use the quality flags from a two minute cadence target um, per sector camera CCD. Um, and apply, bin that down to the 30 minute data. And if there is a quality flag that applies to the entire full frame image, we take that um, and we put them in our, in our quality flags. The other thing that we do is from our pointing model, if we notice that there are some um, 
very high sigma outliers from what we uh, were seeing from other frames, we will quality mask those as well. Um, and so what I'm going to plot here are two different fluxes. The first one that's going to come up in white is the raw flux. So this is um, background subtracted, but hasn't really done anything else to it. Sorry, it's non-background subtracted, and nothing else has been done to it. And then the corrected flux. Um, and so the corrected flux um, is in here in black, and the raw is here in white. And so you can see that the corrected flux, which uses a combination of PCA um, and other regressors, is much flatter than the raw flux. And so if you're looking for long-term trends in your data, that's going to be removed with the corrected flux. So that might not be the flux for you to use. Um, but you also see that these little like jumps down here that might have been um, non-astrophysical totally removed in the raw flux. Um, and so these look great, and our WASP 100 transits pop out really nicely, very cleanly. Um, but then we also have two other light curves that we can look at. We have the PCA flux and the point spread function model flux. And so uh, I'm going to plot the PCA flux here in orange and the PSF flux in a light blue. Um, these also look pretty, pretty great. You see that the long-term trend is removed compared to the raw flux. They also don't have these little bumpy things that are going on down there. Um, but as the, uh, as the, towards the end of the first orbit here for the PSF flux, you know, maybe not doing so great. Um, and then the PCA flux as well, there's a little bit of, you know, curvature there. And so it's really up to you, the user, to look at all of these light curves and decide which one is best for your science. Um, so again, I just want to emphasize that long-term trends, maybe not great for the corrected flux, um, but the raw flux might uh, be the flux that, you know, will help you with your science. If you're looking for transits, corrected flux might be the way to do it. Um, and then if you're missing all of the awesome, awesome tools that are implemented by the light curve with the K no space team, um, we have a really easy way to just import all of the Eleanor data into a light curve, light curve object. So that's light curve with a K no space to a light curve, capital L, capital C, still no space object. Um, and you can pass in whichever flux of the four that you think is best suited for your science. Um, we also store all of the additional fluxes for all of the apertures that are tested. Um, and so you can, you know, use whichever one you want from there as well. Um, and so once you get your light curve object back, it's really easy to just do all of the stuff that you like to do in light curve, which is awesome. Um, and so cool. That was very simple intro to how to get a light curve for one star that was observed in one sector. But as I said earlier, this is a continuous viewing zone target. So what if we want to go ahead and get the light curves for all of the sectors that the star was observed in? So we're going to go back to step one. So instead of initiating an Eleanor.source object, we're going to call an Eleanor.multi-sectors object, um, which will instead return a list of source objects per each sector the target was observed in. Um, if you want a specific sector, you can pass that in as a list or array. Um, otherwise, if you want all of the sectors your target was observed in, you can pass in the keyword sectors equals all, um, and Eleanor will get all of those for you. But right now, I'm going to limit the number of sectors that I'm downloading to sectors two through five, um, just because my <laughs> Wi-Fi isn't the greatest. So, you know, we get all of this information about the downloaded postcards, um, the downloaded 2D postcards, the point A model, et cetera. Um, and these are all cached, which is why it was so fast for me. <laughs> um, and just to see what the stars object is, it's just a list of Eleanor.source objects. Um, OK, so now we can get our light curves for here. And so you'll just loop through each of your Eleanor.target data objects and append it to a list of data objects. Or you can separate them out into time flux flux error arrays if you want to do that right from this loop. Um, I want to save all of the information from the Eleanor.target data object, so I'm just going to create a list of all of those. And now to look at our light curves. Yay! So these look cool. Um, this is the corrected flux per each sector 
And I didn't do any kind of fancy stitching. This is just normalizing each sector by the median per that sector. So it looks really flat, um, but I don't necessarily think this is the best practicing for stitching. Um, so yeah, that looks cool. And so we have like sector two, sector three, sector four and sector five, um, and that's it. And so there are some other things that you can do with the Eleanor.visualize class, which I showed you earlier, which overplotted that aperture contour on top. Um, one of the most useful tricks that we found so far is creating these pixel by pixel light curves to see if the signal in our light curve, main light curve, is coming from the source that we think it is coming from or something nearby. And so you can just call this Eleanor.visualize pixel by pixel and it'll plot the target pixel file here on the left and then the light curve for every pixel in that target pixel file on the right. Um, and so something like this, you know, it's quite obvious that we can see the transit really well here and everything else just kind of looks like noise, but this is a lot of light curves to look at all at once. So you can actually zoom in by setting a column range and a row range. Um, and then the other thing that we're gonna do is color the light curves by the pixel color. So you can see exactly which ones it's coming from. So if the yellow um, pixels here are our target, we can see that the signal is really coming from these yellow pixels and not from any of the nearby um, other sources. Um, and speaking of other sources, you can also do a plotting Gaia overlay based on a magnitude limit search. So what this will do is it'll pop up a TPF with a bunch of circles on it for any nearby sources and the circle size corresponds to the magnitude of that star because it's always great to have more data. And so what you'll do is you'll initiate this Eleanor.crossmatch um, object. And so you just pass in your Eleanor.target data. To check for the two minute data, we use light curve behind the scenes and you just do crossmatch.2 underscore minute. Um, I'm not gonna do this because it will take a little bit longer on my Wi-Fi but hopefully if your Wi-Fi is better than mine, then you won't have that issue. Um, and so this just returns a light curve that search result object, which you can download the data products directly from there and go about using all of the other awesome light curve tools. To check the TASOC pipeline, we use um, Astral Query behind the scenes. And so hopefully, Um, and so we use the astral query behind the scenes to get the data products from MAST, and then we can go ahead and plot what that looks like. So they do have their own quality flags, so we can use the crossmatch.tasoc underscore pixel underscore quality, set that to zero, and then plot the time and raw flux that they currently have. The last one that we can check is the Olkers and Stassen light curve by doing crossmatch.olkers underscore LC, uh, and we can plot that as well. And their light curves are given in magnitudes, which is why this looks upside down. Um, yeah, so I think that's basically it. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions over the Slack, or I'll be holding office hours, like informal office hours tomorrow at UTC 2 p.m. to 3 p.m., but feel free to Slack me, email me with any questions that you have throughout the day. And I hope that helped. Thanks everyone.